financial services and e-commerce practice group. We're very excited about the panel that we have today. Before we get started, I want to mention uh, an important housekeeping point. If you want CLE, and I assume you all want CLE, there are QR codes on your program, outside this door, in the main lobby. Um, you need to scan those in the morning and then when you leave in the afternoon so that you get, um, get credit. Uh, this panel is sponsored by the Financial Services Practice Group. We now have a, a great web page on the FedSoc site where you can track um, all the events, um, all the webinars and uh, articles and everything that the group handles. If you have ideas, please uh, come speak to Nate, speak to myself. Um, we want to be targeting the issues that are most important for your practice and the issues that you're seeing. Now, we're pleased to have a fantastic moderator and panel. Um, and it's my privilege to introduce one of the most principled and hardest working jurists in America today, the Honorable Patrick Bumate. Uh, Judge Bumate, after law school, began his uh, legal career clerking for Judge Timkovich on the Tenth Circuit. He then served in a number of senior and high profile roles in the Department of Justice and finally served as an assistant U.S. attorney before being confirmed to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals in 2019. So, Judge, please take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Paul, for that introduction. We, you know, we've been friends since our 1L year of law school. I think it's safe to say that no one expected either of us to be on this stage today. So uh, thank you for that introduction and thank you for the invitation to be moderating this panel. And I think it's a really important one as well. It's called hyperextension, federal financial agencies and cryptocurrency regulation. I think it's, we, it's safe to say that this is the new frontier of uh, regulation. And I, spe I could speak uh, for most judges in saying that our concept of, of ideas like cryptocurrency, blockchain, and the like is rudimentary at best. So one of the challenges I see when considering regulation in this space is educating the judiciary. And that's only after there's some consensus on what regulation we want. That's why panels like this are so necessary. So now I'll introduce our panelist. Our first speaker is Brian Brooks, a partner at Melvin E. and Myers in Los Angeles and here in DC. Mr. Brooks has had an interesting career on multiple sides of this issue. He's been CEO of Bitfury Group and Binance.us. He was also chief legal officer at Coinbase. In addition, he served as the acting comptroller of the, of the currency during the uh, Trump administration. Next, we'll have Caitlin Long, founder and CEO of Custodia Bank. Ms. Long has been a self-described Bitcoin evangelist since 2012. She's also had a 22-year career on Wall Street and has served on Wyoming's blockchain task force. She's going to talk about some interesting litigation going on between Custodia Bank and the Federal Reserve. And finally, we will have Professor Christopher Peterson of the University of Utah College of Law. Professor Peterson was in the leadership at the Consumer Financial Product uh, Protection Bureau during the Obama administration. He's extensively researched the FDIC and the Federal Reserve. And in 2020, Professor Peterson ran for governor of the great state of Utah. So before we get to Q&A, each panelist will now give their opening remarks. Brian, do you want to kick us off? <clears throat> Is that a question? <laughs> I'm not sure if I want to kick us off. So, uh, so, so thank you, uh, thank you for the introduction and thanks everybody for being here. This is a, it's a great time to have this conversation, I think. We're having this conversation during the Supreme Court term where the future of Chevron will be decided. We are having this conversation at a time when the role and discretion of the banking agencies uh, through Caitlin's lawsuit is being decided and these are really fundamental issues. So I, I think it's gonna be a great conversation. I want to talk about a couple things uh, here just to kind of introduce the topic and then I think we're going to have some great debate among the panelists. So the first thing I want to talk about a little bit is what crypto is and why it matters. Um, I'm not going to presume a high level of knowledge, let alone enthusiasm among this group, but I, I think I'm going to convince you that it's a little bit different than what you think. And then I want to orient you to um, our administration's approach to crypto regulation 
which is, um, I think it's safe to say, it's, it's not just different from, it's, it's literally the opposite of the approach of this administration. And you can make your own judgments about who you agree with, but it's important to understand the paradigms. So let me start with, with the concept of what crypto is. Crypto, I believe, is a species of one of the two macro forces that are reshaping the delivery of financial services globally and ultimately reshaping the financial system. So I've written pretty extensively about the idea that the two macro forces changing the way financial services is delivered are unbundling and decentralization. And let me just talk for 30 seconds about what I mean by both of those things. So historically in the United States, at least in the 20th century and today, the concept of financial services revolved around the simultaneous delivery of three different services. And those services are deposit taking, payment processing, and lending. And there was a belief for a long time that the only way to deliver financial services was to have all three of those things sitting in the same place. So if you think about it, the only really efficient way to make loans is to have a pool of low cost capital where you can earn a spread between the cost of raising the capital and the income derived by lending out the capital at a higher rate of interest. And so that is thought to mean that you can't really be an effective lender unless you are also a deposit taker. And incidental to deposit taking is payment processing. After all, if you want to pay your cable bill, there has to be money on deposit somewhere that you can use to remit that payment. And thus we came up with this concept of what was colloquially known in the 20th century as the money center. And the biggest banks were called money center banks. Technology arose uh, called the internet, which meant that some of those assumptions may no longer be true. They may have been vestiges of an era when, uh, when centralization was, was necessary and centralization may no longer be necessary. And the analogy that many people talk about in crypto is the post office analogy. So once upon a time, if you wanted to communicate with a person far, far away, you had to have a centralized aggregator of those communications. That's what the post office was. So you would take all your letters on a Monday morning, some were going to Salt Lake City and some were going to Miami and some to Utah, but you'd put them at one place and the post office would then aggregate all the letters to Miami in one slot and all the letters to Utah in another slot and it would then farm them back out and deliver them. With the rise of the internet, the concept of centralization no longer mattered. I can now send an email directly to you and it does not have to go through a central repository. We can have node-based networks uh, and we no longer need the post office the way that we once did. And the metaphor for banking is very similar to that. It may be in an internet world that I no longer need to raise deposits in order to make loans. I can have peer-to-peer -peer lending networks where in real time I can find a source of funds for my loans that way. So unbundling is a general feature of internet technology that is changing financial services. The other feature, and this is where crypto comes in, the other feature, the other macro event that changes financial services is decentralization. So if you think about the way centralization works in the traditional financial system, the idea is that in addition to bundling all these services I talked about, you have a management team, and the management team is making decisions about which loans to make, which customers to onboard, which products and services to offer. And this is why, you know, at a bank, you'll have a credit committee that at one bank might be willing to make oil and gas loans, and in another bank, they're not willing to make oil and gas loans. One company might be long on commercial real estate, another might make residential mortgages. But they're making discretionary judgments on that basis. And there are advantages to that, right? There are also disadvantages, which is human beings make mistakes. And when you have a centralized system of decision making, you can have a credit committee that doesn't recognize changes in the interest rate curve or that uh, perhaps is very bullish on a sector that is ultimately going to fail, but they nonetheless invest in that sector and make mistakes. Another technology development has created unbundling, and that technology development is called blockchain. Okay? The concept of a blockchain is the idea of a network that, is, that has distributed ownership and control, where there is no one person making decisions and no one person can decide uh, for example, to turn off your bank account or to suspend your ability to uh, take credit or to make payments. But to have a decentralized network, somebody has to be induced to contribute the computing power to the network. So in the original internet, which is a centrally managed thing, you had big companies like Google and Facebook delivering the computing power to make the network function. If you're gonna have a decentralized network do things like I've just described, then somebody has to get paid and the way they get paid is through cryptocurrencies. And so when you hear people talk about tokens, uh, whether it's Bitcoin or Ethereum or, or some of these other tokens that you hear people talk about, the original concept behind those tokens was, if, if you think about Bitcoin as the very first one, the idea was Bitcoin is the reward that you get 
for helping to maintain the network. It's as simple as that. And that's true across lots of other blockchains as well. Now, we won't get into the complexities of the different layers of blockchains, but just think about cryptocurrencies as your reward for helping to support a decentralized network. Turns out there are a lot of reasons that decentralization matters. My favorite example is if you think back to the famous Canadian trucker protest over the COVID lockdowns back in whatever year that was. I, I've tried to put the COVID lockdowns out of my mind, so I purposely don't remember the year. One of the things that happened during the COVID lockdowns in Canada was when the truckers protested the need to show COVID tests every time they crossed the border with their, with their, uh, with their, um, uh, with their haul, was that their bank accounts were turned off. And if you think about the idea of, of what money is about and what banking is supposed to be about, this was money that these people had earned from work, they had paid taxes on it, and they'd simply deposit it in a bank for future use. And one day the government decided that their political views were so outrageous that their bank account should be turned off and they shouldn't be able to have lunch. They should be literally starved out of their protest. And that is something that can only be accomplished in a centralized system, right? You need command and control to do something like take somebody's money away from them. That really energized the crypto community because one of the things about decentralized systems is nobody can control it. So there is no government who can tell you that your next Bitcoin uh, send receive transaction will be turned off. And that's one of the social urgencies of decentralization. One of the reasons why so much interest exists in this asset class is for people who believe in civil liberty, um, decentralized systems are thought to be superior on balance to centralized systems. You don't have to believe any of that, but that is what the people who live in this world and act in this industry really believe. So let me now make my comments about our regulatory approach to this activity, okay? So you have these tokens that are basically maintenance rewards for these underlying networks. These underlying networks, you may use them, you may not use them, but there's no arguing that on a given day, the market cap of this sector is well north of a trillion dollars. The number of participants in this country alone is well north of 50 million people. So there is a non-trivial market for this asset class. You may not own this, but many of your friends and neighbors do, and they have a thesis for why they own it, much as you might have a thesis for why you own the stocks and bonds that you own. And so in our administration, um, when I was controller, we had a thesis that these assets were new, they were relatively risky, but there was a growing market for them. And our belief was that the purpose of the regulated financial system was to provide a framework for risk management. So we looked at these relatively risky activities and we asked ourselves, how can we provide supervision, licensing, custody, and, and other financial infrastructure to allow these assets to grow and gain market acceptance or not, but to do it in a way that is predictable, stable, and safe. And so we issued several pieces of uh, guidance on this. The first piece of guidance that we issued was, was guidance in the summer of 2020 that said that national banks have the legal authority to custody crypto assets. And our theory of this was that we looked back at the history of bank custody powers and we found that over a long period of time, banks had been authorized to custody not only specie, not, not only gold and silver coin back in the, in the day, but also more exotic assets like fine wine held for investment, um, art held for investment, uh, you know, digital security tokens in the traditional environment, you know, digital uh, uh, stock certificates, things like this. And we saw no difference between Bitcoin and fine wine. These are non-cash, high-value assets and banks have long expertise in building safety and security around the custody process for those things, and we believe that the industry would be safer if we allowed banks, as opposed to non-banks, to custody crypto assets. Now, an interesting thing happened that day. Uh, I was just looking at this uh, just a couple of days ago. One hour after we issued guidance saying something as simple as banks can custody crypto assets, the price of Bitcoin jumped more than 30% and it stayed elevated at that level for nine or 10 weeks thereafter. So it tells you something about the idea that the market is so unclear, that the regulatory framework for crypto is so uncertain that any point of light creates a 30% price jump. It's bananas, but that, that is the case. So fast forward, we then looked at the next issue in crypto, which has to do with um, a certain kind of crypto asset called a stable coin. This is a, a blockchain native token that conveys price stable value, usually dollar equivalent. So you might think of a stable coin as like the modern day equivalent of a prepaid debit card, okay? It's not cash, it's a piece of electronic collateral, but it's like an internet version of a prepaid card. And we said something very simple. We said banks 
are authorized to hold the reserve assets that back stablecoins. So if you're going to issue 10 stablecoins worth a dollar, you have to have $10 on deposit in the bank. And again, our view was, well, banks used to support American Express Traveler's Checks, and banks support the Bed Bath & Beyond card. Okay, that's probably a bad example. <laughs> but it also supported a lot of non-bankrupt prepaid cards. So our theory was, backing these kinds of prepaid assets is something banks have a long history of doing. It's part of their legal authority in the payments authorization, so banks are allowed to do that. And again, within about a week of us doing that, the velocity of the larger stablecoin projects increased 50%. I mean, just very simple regulatory clarity created massive market activity to the good of the holders. We had a few more pieces of guidance like that, and at the end of my term, the term sort of was capped with my granting the first crypto bank charter. Now, if Caitlin had come in for a national bank charter, you know, she might have been having this conversation, but we chartered a bank called Anchorage Digital Bank, which was a custody-only trust bank, but it was the first crypto business that was allowed inside of the national banking system. And again, you know, a lot of good positive market activity followed from that. And then our administration came to the end of the term. On the first day of the Biden administration, a number of things that I did were repealed. So that's how I knew I was really provocative, is I was a first day repealer. Some, some people's things didn't get repealed for a week or two. But I, I had some things repealed on the very first day. And at a certain point, uh, the administration came out and took a position, which they are now taking uh, today, which is, right as we may have been legally, and the Biden administration did put out guidance saying grudgingly that they agreed with our legal analysis, but they decided nonetheless that even though banks have these legal powers, crypto was A, just too risky, and B, just not useful enough to be allowed in the banking system. And so they took risky activity that was being managed inside the system in our administration and pushed it outside the system. So I'll leave you with this question, and then I'll turn it over to, to Caitlin or whoever the next speaker is, but I'll leave you with this question. The core philosophical difference between the Trump administration and the Biden administration on crypto is, do you believe the purpose of the bank charter is to keep risky activity outside of banks because we're here to protect banks? Or do you believe the purpose of the bank charter is to take risky financial activity and bring it inside of a supervised system with capital, liquidity, and risk management requirements so that the kind of financial intermediation that wealth creation demands can be overseen in some safe and sound way? Our philosophy was the latter. This administration's philosophy is the former. You decide. Thank you. Ms. Long? Thank you, Judge. Uh, I'll give some background on what brought me into this industry because I think it might help folks who are wondering what's the big deal with digital assets. When I was running the pension solutions business at Morgan Stanley in New York, I s kept running into the morass of settlement in the financial system. And it is a place where there are a lot of nefarious activities. It is a place where mom and pop's pockets are being picked regularly, and it is a place where we have the technology to settle the settlement problem. And what am I referring to by the settlement problem? It's why securities transactions settle two days after the trade date. It's why payments, the ACH payment system is one to three days. If you are settling Fedwire, you can settle same day, but you can't program your payment to settle at a particular minute or settle something where say you have a securities transaction and you're sending a fed wire those two things settle at the same time and as a result of that gap in settlement between one leg one and leg two of any financial transaction there is an enormous amount of counterparty credit risk that is in the financial system if we step back and Think about how that evolved. In the middle of the last century, actually in the middle of the 19th century, we were able to communicate transcontinentally through simple data structures like Morse code. But that meant that the financial data leg of a transaction could move at the speed of light. But the money leg, back then money was gold. Gold could only move at the speed of matter. And that gap between moving data at the speed of light and moving money at the speed of matter is what created all of this counterparty credit risk. And as a result of that, the financial system created layers of abstraction 
well, let's abstract the physical gold and have a piece of paper that's redeemable for the IOU. Well, then let's actually put pieces of paper redeemable for those pieces of paper on top of it. And eventually what ended up happening is the dollar itself under all that pressure to create credit became an IOU itself. Go look at the money in your wallet. It is an IOU of the Federal Reserve Bank. It didn't used to be. We eventually, as a result of all of this pressure, which again stems from the fundamental gap between moving data at the speed of light and moving money at the speed of matter, we lost, we lost money and the, in, in, the, in the sense that we lost control of it. Money itself became credit. And as a result of that, the US economy ultimately decoupled from what it was up until the late 1960s, which was an equity financed economy, to now a debt financed economy, and one that is fundamentally unstable. So I set about trying to fix the settlement problem that I saw on Wall Street. I saw a lot of nefarious things, especially in the securities lending business. I also got involved with moving multi-billion dollar payments between two non-banks where we had to get the Federal Reserve involved. And it just made no sense to me that this is how the system worked. So those are the fundamental problems. Ultimately, that, that fun, all, the, all the abstractions that created these layers, and, and, and we lawyers had to deal, by the way, I'm not a practicing attorney, but I did go to law school. Um, the, uh, uh, the, the, the layers of abstraction and all of the legal gymnastics that had to be created in order to solve for that settlement mismatch. And, and I'm referring to UCC Article 8, for those of you who are financial services specialists. Um, we wouldn't need that if transaction data and money settled at the same time, or if securities and money could settle at the same time. But what we need to be able to do that is programmability of money and that is what Bitcoin brings us and that is what stable coins bring us for US dollars. Now second point is what is the role of the states in what I'm just describing? Those of you who are familiar with the history of banking may understand that banks in the United States have always been chartered by the states. It wasn't until the Civil War era that the National Bank Act of 1863 created the federal chartering authority that Brian was the acting controller of the OCC, where we, we, ha we now have what's called a dual banking system, national banks and state chartered banks that have exactly the same rights. If you fast forward, two utilities were created to service the banking system. One was the Federal Reserve in 1913, which runs the payment system, and the other was the FDIC, which is the insurance company for the industry. And they were both created by Congress to service the entire industry as utilities. There, was, there were multiple reforms of the Federal Reserve in history, but one meaningful one happened in 1980. And it was back when Paul Volcker was trying to get control of the inflation of the 1970s. And member banks were disadvantaged, Fed member banks were disadvantaged because they had to park reserves at the Fed, but the Fed wasn't at that time paying interest on those reserves. And in a high inflation, high interest rate environment, the cost of capital was so high that member banks were fleeing the Federal Reserve System. And that made his job coming in as the, as the chairman of the Fed in 1980 even harder because if you studied economics in school, you understand, especially back then, where credit was created almost exclusively in the banking system, you understood that the banks took a dollar of the monetary base and multiplied it to become roughly $10 of M2. Well, if that, if that process was happening outside of the control of the Fed, it was much harder for Volcker to get control of inflation. So what did he do? He literally begged Congress to pass the Monetary Control Act of 1980 to treat all depository institutions on an equal playing field and require every depository institution in the United States to hold their reserves at the Fed so that they were all inside the system and all this credit creation that was happening outside the system was something that he could get control over. So the bargain that the Fed made was that all depository institutions were required to hold reserves at the Fed 
and the Federal Reserve was required to service all depository institutions. And I won't go into the details of what is an eligible depository institution, but, but for purposes of this discussion, you can assume that it is a validly chartered state chartered bank or a validly chartered OCC bank uh, uh, that, that holds a national charter. What has happened in the, in the ensuing decades is that States have started to charter banks that the Fed has viewed as non-traditional. And what is interesting about that is that it's an eclectic group of states. Dating back to the real estate crisis of the late 1980s, a, a few northeastern states created uninsured state bank charters, and then after the FDIC refused to provide insurance for any bank servicing the digital asset industry that, that was a startup. A few other states, Wyoming and Nebraska, chartered a new type of bank, also uninsured. And then, most recently, the state of Idaho, which has a, char a state banking statute that doesn't require its banks to be insured, started to charter payment banks that are uninsured banks. So now you have six US states and potentially many more, everybody's watching this, who are trying to figure out, all right, did the Monetary Control Act actually mean what it said? That all depository institutions had access to the Federal Reserve System. If you step back and think about the statute, it's 12 U.S.C. 248A, the statute that says the Federal Reserve Literally all eligible depository institutions had to hold their reserves at the Federal Reserve. And now you see states saying, well, some of these payment innovators, the FDIC won't insure them, so now what? What's also interesting about innovation in financial services is if you think about the mission statements of federal financial regulators, I'm not aware of a single one of them, whether it was the OCC, the FDIC, the SEC, that has economic development or innovation within their remit. In fact, their, their incentives as, as agencies is to block innovation. However, the states almost always have economic development in their remit. So what is the practical implication of that? The practical implication is that the states are the laboratories of democracy and the innovations bubble up from the states. But what we started to see under the Obama administration, under Operation Choke Point 1.0, is the federal banking regulator, in that case the FDIC, started to pick and choose which industries got to, got to have banking services. And we subsequently started to see the Federal Reserve start to block applications from validly chartered state chartered banks for Federal Reserve master accounts. So the impact of this is that there's been a centralization of power in the banking industry in Washington, D.C. That, that is trying to override the dual banking system and the ability of states to charter their own banks. They're now in Washington, D.C. going through what is effectively a veto process where federal banking agencies are asserting jurisdiction that they do not have over whether states have the right to charter banks. And that is the impetus for our lawsuit. Our lawsuit, of course, is not something I can talk about. I respect the process. Uh, and it is subject to a, uh, a protective order. The fundamental question it comes down to has nothing to do with crypto. I'm interested in using crypto as a technology to solve that settlement problem. The fundamental question of the lawsuit is, does the Federal Reserve have the right to veto a state's bank chartering authority. I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Professor Peterson. Uh, <clears throat> well, um, hi, everybody. Thank you. Um, first, I want to say thank you, Judge, for agreeing to host the panel. Um, it's uh, kind of cool to be on a panel where there's a United States Court of Appeals judge that's moderating it. That's a, and also with a controller of the currency <laughs> and and a bank CEO. I'm I'm just a public school teacher from Utah, <laughs> um, and I and I'm pretty much the least fancy speaker in the entire conference program. So it's an honor to be here. I do want to thank 
Also, um, Sam Fendler, who uh, did the logistics on our panel um, it really efficiently, and the audiovisual people um, that are working back there, and all the um, servers at the hotel, they're taking care of us. Um, I, 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 I'm, I'm the token liberal on the panel, <laughs> um, uh, and I, but it's an honor to do that, but I think, because I believe in civil discourse and reason debate and um, you know, a civil society that, that, that has a, you know, a competition in ideas and tries to find a pathway forward for our uh, republic in a way that's constructive. Um, and I guess I'm also, in addition to being the token liberal, I'm also the token crypto skeptic, I think, uh, in the panel. And, um, so I, I, I and I have, and I want to start out with a confession, and I don't know why this happened. Uh, when cryptocurrency first came about, I was a little bit skeptical to begin, begin with, but open to the ideas. I really like complicated rule systems. I, I teach constitutional law, I teach contracts, but I also teach commercial law, and it's my favorite class to teach by far because. Article 9 of the Uniform Commercial Code is so complicated and intricate. It's a beautiful creation of human ingenuity. And there was a part of me that thought, you know what, cryptocurrency is going to be kind of like that too. I, I, the, like payment systems and the settlement problem, that's a real problem. That would be cool if we had some way to fix that. But before too long, uh, I, the more I heard about what was happening and the, and the problems with it, eventually in my mind, probably about three or four or five years ago, Anytime anybody ever said the words crypto, in my mind, I would try to be polite and smile, and I don't want to offend anybody. This is the, but remember, this is the, we don't do cancel culture, so I'm going to say something that's a little <laughs> bit edgy, but whenever I hear the word crypto assets, in my mind, I hear the words magic beans. <laughs> um, because I'm not really convinced that there's a lot of value add to these, to these financial instruments or the, these, these um, distributed ledger products, uh, um, uh, non-fungible tokens, et cetera. And I, so I could be wrong about that. I mean, there's still the potential that this will somehow revolutionize and there's gonna be some value there, but they're not farming, they're not feeding anybody, they're not transporting goods, they're not manufacturing goods. They're just making up new different types of crypto assets that are all you know distributed ledgers, I get that. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But, the, the other problem with them is that there are lots and lots of law and order scandals that keep happening over and over and over in, in this sector of the economy. And if, I'm, if you think I'm being too uncollegial or uncivil by using the term magic beans to describe all of it all, um, let me just go through a couple of scandals and maybe you'll, you'll, you'll feel better about me. Um, for, first off, I'm gonna start with one called, and I'm not making this up, and it also happened after I came to call it magic beans. It's a company called Beanstalk Farms. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't make that up. That was what they called themselves. Um, it's, a, it's a DeFi or decentralized finance um, governance protocol that would allow people who own the assets to um, vote to change the code, which is, oh, it's decentralized. So you could change the software code. If, all, you, know, if you own some assets on, uh, uh, for being stock farms, then you can vote to change the, the software code. But they also had flash loans that would allow you to borrow assets, um, you know, probably for you know, whatever complicated hedging strategy you had or whatever. And so you could borrow assets and then give them back really quickly. So some entrepreneurial person borrowed a whole bunch of assets in a flash loan that got them just enough to actually be able to change the code. And then they changed the code to allow them to steal um, about $182 million of crypto assets. Magic beans uh, were what Beanstalk Farms was selling, it turned out. Um, and, and it's not, Axe Infinity is a second example. Axe Infinity is a video game where you can make uh, crypto assets, get paid crypto assets. It's a, um, a pay to earn game, they call it. And it's on something called the Ronin Network. Um, uh, and so all around the world, apparently it was particularly used a lot in Southeast Asia, but here in the States too, people were playing this video game because they're getting paid in crypto assets. I gather it was a mediocre video game. I don't know, I never played it. But um, they're making all this crypto, these crypto assets uh, um, uh, playing video games and the North Koreans came in and hacked it and stole all of the assets. The North Korean government has a crypto hacking um, or operation and stole, uh, it was 597 million in crypto assets, including $25 million in a, um, a US, uh, USDC, which is a stable coin pegged to the value of the US dollar. 
And then uh, this third example, uh, Winter Mule, they were a vanity address um, company. Their deal was, you know, so, so in, a, in, a, in a crypto uh, asset, you've got a, a private key or a private account, uh, which is usually just a bunch of letters and numbers and gibberish. It's not very fun to talk about. And so this company would save your private key, but then give you on top of that layer on a vanity address that would be like, you know, Crypto Bro 99 or something like that. Um, it's just a joke, don't be mad. Um, uh, 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 and anyway, this, it, but it had a, it had a bunch of um, security problems and so somebody came in and, and hacked it and people lost $160 million in crypto assets through, through this hole that it had introduced in, in people's private keys. Fourth example, um, uh, uh, Terra's algorithmic stable coin. So this is a, a, another um, stable coin that was pegged to US dollar, uh, but they, didn't, they weren't holding dollar for dollar assets. They had an algorithm that was sort of giving a, a you know, suggesting that they had sufficient assets to back the, the, the stable coin, but it turns out, of course, they didn't, and that collapsed, and you know, I, I, hard, to, hard to judge how, what the loss in value was. I read something that said $60 billion, which seems high to me, but you know, I don't know, that's, it's a, a, a massive loss um, where they were representing themselves as having, you know, having that, that one of their crypto assets had the same value as the United States uh, legal tender did, and they were representing that they had figured out a way to guarantee that they were going to have reserves sufficient to cover those losses, which proved to be utterly false. Um, and then uh, another example, uh, I, I, this one's not that, I, I, I just got to put it in there because it's the guy's name. This guy's name was, it is, I'm, I have never met him, I'm sure he's a lovely guy, I don't mean to be to pick on his name, but his name is Shady Mashinsky. <laughs> 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 it's, it's great. It's fantastic. <laughs> he, he operated Celsius, which was a um, crypto lender. Um, but really what he had was a crypto asset uh, Ponzi scheme um, where he wa they were, you know, uh, getting investments and then, you know, having big returns. And then, of course, he was paying the, the new people with, um, uh, uh, sorry, the old investors with the new people's uh, crypto assets. And it was just a, just a typical Ponzi scheme. Um, and people lost over a billion dollars in assets to his, his uh, to Shady Mashinsky's <laughs> it's crypto lending, I'm sorry. Um, and, I, and I haven't even got to FTX, which was the biggest one. Sam Bankman fried just got convicted of fraud, apparently, and, and billions of dollars in assets. I'm going to mention one more because I know I'm going too, on too long. Um, uh, it's a company that you probably haven't heard of. It's called the Nomad Change Bri Chain Bridge. It's a cross-chain bridge. The idea is you have different assets on different blockchains. So maybe you've got some Ethereum and you want to buy, I don't know, uh, Dogecoin or Moonbeam or whatever. But you don't want to you don't want to change it into dollars with your wallet because that might be um, there might be a know your customer verification there. They might see that you might be committing tax fraud or maybe you're you're um, uh, trying to launder assets or maybe you just don't like dollars and you want crypto. That's fine too, maybe. Um, but but they would port from one blockchain to the other using smart contracts on the Ethereum blockchain. They made a whole bunch of representations about and the, the software was designed um, uh, just about 20 minutes from where I live. In, in, in Salt Lake City, just, or just in the suburbs of Salt Lake City. They made a whole bunch of representations. They were going to have watchers that would um, uh, it'd take a half hour for these transactions to settle because they have watchers that are going to verify that it's not getting hacked and made, you know, it's the, it's the, it's the safest, best, you know, non, you know, perfectly safe way to do this. Um, uh, uh, but uh, what happened was they updated their software protocol and, um, uh, and uh, they somehow a backdoor was introduced into the software. Um, and the next day, uh, uh, somebody came and I don't remember how was stole about you know 50 bucks worth of crypto assets by just going into somebody's wallet and using this backdoor to just extract the money out of their wallet. The chain bridge introduced a security problem with the block, blockchain, allowed them to take 50 bucks. No watchers came and stopped them. It turns out that no watchers came to stop them because even though the company promised that there would be these watchers that would do this, they never appointed any watchers. It just didn't even exist. It wasn't even, um, nobody, they never actually implemented the basic security protocols that they had promised all of the people that they would adopt. 
At least that's what I believe happened. Um, uh, and uh, and and uh, the next, so after after that 50 bucks got stolen, the next day they came back and about 186 million dollars of crypto assets are taken out of people's wallets. Some of these people are, you know, maybe not that sympathetic, but a lot of them are long haul truck drivers that are listening to crypto podcasts and invested their retirement account into this instead of a Vanguard um, low fee mutual fund. Uh, that's they 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 got wiped out because they used this cross chain bridge. And um, I know this one because I, I should just disclose, I, I, in addition to being a country lawyer, I also am of counsel at a law firm here in DC called Gupta Wessler, um, full-time law teacher, but I also um, you know, try to look for cases that they might be interested in, help them on their appellate briefs, um, that kind of thing. Um, and so we and another law firm, a couple law firms, got together, found, figured this out, this was happening, got some clients and were suing them for federal racketeering because we think that that's a money transmitter and they were doing unlicensed money laundering and that they committed wire fraud and lying to all their customers about the security features that didn't exist. Now, I could be wrong about all those facts, those are alleged, but we're pretty sure that that's what happened. Um, and I think it was wrong. And, and, and if there's anything, I'll just stop on, the, on the, my rant about you know, the lack of law and order in the market, um, having disclosed my stake in that, in that case. There's a verb that I figured out that exists. It's called uh, rugging. Do you, have you heard this? Do you know what this is? So the, the idea is uh, you build you build the the, the 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 you know the I don't know the pillow fort in your front room on top of the rug, and everybody's talking about it. you get this structure. It's all really wonderful, but then you just pull the rug out from underneath them, and that's happening over and over in all these different in many of these cryptocurrency systems that they've developed a special verb for when that happens. It's called rugging somebody. And, and that's when the whole system falls apart and collapses. Um, so I, I don't think that that, that for, for people that know what the word rugging is, the fact that this happens again and again may not be a bug in the system, it's the feature of the system itself. So I, I guess that my second point, second broad point I wanna make is that um, I, a lot of the time I hear a lot about decentralization. And I, I think two things about this, first, it's not clear to me that these are really decentralized systems. Yes, the ledger is decentralized, unlike the Federal Reserve, which keeps it the records of everybody in the ACH system or the Fedwire system. Everybody has a copy of the ledger on all their computers. I get that. But in other ways, the system is not decentralized. Why? There's a, they've got a software protocol that's the same in everybody, and there's, some, there's a group of people that's controlling the software protocol, which introduces centralized uh, 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 holes or problems into the system in, 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 in ways that, that isn't solved by having lots of different copies of the ledger and different records. And then second, even if, it, even if some of these systems are more decentralized, it's not clear to me, it's not self-evident to me that that's all that particularly useful all the time. It takes more energy. Did you know that Bitcoin, which is probably the most legit of all of the cryptocurrencies, every year Bitcoin uses as much electricity uh, as Norway does. Um, that's a lot of electricity, a lot of coal, a lot of, a lot of oil that we're burning just to kind of create this math puzzle uh, uh, to create a, a, a crypto asset that really doesn't have that many more value uses than, than fiat currencies. Maybe in El Salvador or Guatemala or, or somewhere where their, their currency is not stable, but I, you know, I, I don't know. Um, and I, I guess I, I also think that, that um, it is facilitating some extremely socially destructive behaviors. Crypto assets are uh, the asset of choice for um, ransomware hackers, uh, uh, kidnappers, uh, uh, child pornographers, and drug dealers in many instances. Also, people are just investing in them, but that is part of what this ecosystem is all about. Um, and then I guess last point I'll say is that, you know, I get that, that there are going to be some controversial lawsuits where the SEC, the Commodities Future, uh, the CFTC, uh, uh, moving in to try to impose some law and order on, on this system where there are all these scandals happening. And the definitions in their foundational organic statutes often have some ambiguity in them. What is a security? What is a commodity? What is a money transmitter? Uh, what does it mean to be safe and sound? Um, I, 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 what, what, is, what are the precise definitions of deceptive, unfair, and abusive practices? Congress passed statutes that have ambiguity in them to respond to the many different kinds of commercial behaviors and practices that evolve over time. But 
the, the federal regulators have to step in to try to create law and order. Congress has not acted because Congress is in gridlock and hasn't done anything. Maybe they will at some point, but they haven't yet. Uh, and so wh what else can they do other than try to step up and respond to some of these abuses that are happening, uh, you know, I think in a rampant way in the marketplace. Um, so I, I think that the, that the, the the federal regulators have not overreached. Um, now they're gonna win some cases, they're losing some cases. We'll see how it all plays out. The people that I think have overreached are people like Beanstalk Farms, Sam Bankman Freed, and uh, a slurry of other charlatans and scammers that are ripping people off. That's who's overreached. Uh, maybe I'm the law and order guy after all, not you. <laughs> excellent, well thank you all for these excellent uh, opening remarks and staying within your time limits. Uh, we have about 45 minutes for questions and answers, but before we get to Q&A, I'd like to give the panelists an opportunity to respond to anything they've heard uh, from the other panelists. Uh, I know you two seem like you're jumping at the bit. <laughs> Who wants to go first? I'll start by saying I grant most of what you said. <laughs> there right. Are, <laughs> right. There are, I, I had a debate with one of the very, very er early Bitcoiners whether 90% or 99% of the industry needs to just burn on a raging funeral pyre. It does. The same thing was true of the early internet. The problem is exactly what Brian was l alluding to. By not creating any regulated pathway, all of these scams proliferate in the dark. And I do believe the Department of Justice is massively underfunded in this enforcement area, could be going, with, going after a lot more of the criminals and scammers than they are in this industry. I hope they continue to. And I am someone who has handed evidence to law enforcement of one of the biggest frauds in this space, trying to clean it up. But by approaching it the way you're approaching it, you're literally shoving all of this activity into the dark markets and keeping the good actors on the sideline. That is exactly what the Biden administration has chosen to do. They, they executed a, shall we say, in Wyoming we would call it a shoot the stallion to scatter the herd approach. They went after Coinbase, which was the closest to getting approved by the SEC, has been working for years to try to get a regulated pathway by the SEC. The Fed, the White House and Senator Dick Durbin went after my bank, <laughs> which ha wasn't even open. How, how Dick Durbin even knew to attack us on the center, Senate floor when we weren't even open yet? And, the, and, and it, I have been public about the fact that we knew the White House and the Fed sent the press after us because two days before the Fed voted down our bank charter membership application, two major news outlets were hounding us, telling us that we were going to be voted down. So, and by the way, we, they put it in writing in one case that all of the applicants in front of federal banking agencies that had any crypto to their business model were simultaneously asked to, uh, to withdraw their applications. That's in writing. Okay, so clearly there was, it's now obvious, there's an all of government coordinated approach to take the best players who were actually trying to create a lit market, a regulated pathway for these activities to be able to use this technology. And those were the ones who got skewered the, the worst by the regulators. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna try something a little bit different. <laughs> Shady Mashinsky. <laughs> <laughs> so there's, there's, there's nobody named Shady Mashinsky. There's a guy named Alex Mashinsky. And um, it's, it's funny how when you gild the lily, it, uh, oh, you, you I lose a little that. credibility. He's an actual person, not named Shady. No idea where that comes from. But what I will it's tell you is- It's in the newspaper. I mean, I didn't make it's it not, up. It's not but, accurate. <laughs> but it's just not true. So, so here's what I want. I, I want to make sort of two broad points, and then there are a couple things I do want to deconstruct. But the first broad point I would make is for every shady Mashinsky, you know, that you can name, there's a Bernie Madoff. I mean, human beings are flawed people. <clears throat> this is why we build regulated systems, is to constrain the human impulse for fraud, greed, corruption. There's nothing, I mean, like, there's nothing about crypto 
other than value, and when they're criminals, they're looking for ways to obtain value for no consideration. People steal things. That's why we have a banking system, is to make it harder to steal things. So I would just begin by saying, oh my God, we've named five scandals. I can name many more scandals than that in the banking system, and so can you. So that's not an indictment of the system, that's an indictment of people. And that's why we have disclosure, capital, liquidity, anti-fraud, Bank Secrecy Act, and all kinds of other things that everybody in this room knows well. That's an argument for conducting market activities inside of a regulated system as opposed to keeping them out because they're so very scary. There's a deeper thing, though, that Chris says that I want to unpack for a minute. And, and, and he said it, you know, in a way that sounds very plausible. He says there's, there's not a lot of value add here. He said they're, they're not farming. They're not feeding anyone. They're not manufacturing anything. And, and that's true. So the question then is, who decides in a market economy what has value? So I was just going to ask all of you this question. How many of you in this audience own a snowmobile? Nobody. So that sounds like an argument. We should probably ban snowmobiles. I don't have any use for them at all. I, I cannot imagine why we even have them. In most of the states, it doesn't even snow that much. With global warming and they use gas, we should probably just ban them. Now, how many here smoke cigarettes every day? Uh, again, and they cause cancer, probably we should just ban them, I, I, I think. We should just ban cigarettes and snowmobiles. How many of you still have black lights from the 70s? <laughs> now, some of us who remember those, we'd argue there actually was utility there. You, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but for the most of we should probably just ban them because not that many people want them. They're kind of weird and sketchy, maybe even skeevy. We don't want, we don't want black lights. But wait, wait, this is the Federalist Society. We, we know that in a market economy, the government doesn't get to tell us what things are useful enough to be allowed in the market. That's like Bernie Sanders' comment that we have too many different styles of shoes in this country. You know, this is Nikita Khrushchev stuff. You, 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 don't, you don't tell other people what utility they get to derive out of a product that you yourself don't find important. There are a million things that we do every day that do not feed anyone, they don't manufacture anyone, they don't farm anything. And yet, weirdly, we derive utility from the fact that we could buy those things if we wanted to. That's what markets are about. And if you look at every stock that's listed on the NASDAQ, and there are several thousand of them, I'll bet most of you in this room have never and would never buy any of those companies' products. But we allow the market to decide whether those things have value. We don't allow the government to decide whether those have value. And that's, that's very troubling. Now I want to go through just a couple of things here that I think are, are actually worth unpacking just so people understand it, people who aren't crypto-native people. So one is <clears throat> the comment about the long-haul truck drivers who were listening to crypto podcasts. Now I will tell you, I've had some weird experiences with random people who listen to crypto podcasts. The, it, there is a strange culture here, I will grant you that. I, I had a famous experience once where I was in the back of an Uber in uh, suburban Charleston, South Carolina. And it was one of the weirder Ubers I've ever been in. You know, normally your Uber is like a Honda Accord, or if you're a rich guy, it's like a Yukon. But this was like an old Pontiac. I've never actually been in an Uber like this. But I was in the back seat with my fiance going to a suburban shopping mall. It's just a, just a vignette here. And we're driving to the shopping mall because it's the only place with the lens crafters open on a Sunday. You don't care about any of these details. But the point is, as we're driving down the street, I, I am who I am, and she ran crypto at a very famous company you've all heard of. And, um, and the driver at some point, he said, uh, he said um, you know, in this low country accent, do you all know anything about, um, about crypto? <laughs> and you know, you don't really want to be in a conversation on one of those lonely highways in suburban Charleston, South Carolina. So you kind of, yeah, yeah, I know a little bit. Well, what do you know about it? I, I'm invested in, and he lists some list of, of assets. Well, I know, I know a little bit about it. And, and so we have a little conversation. And at a certain point, he looks in his rear view mirror and then he asks me another question, and I answer again, and he looks in the rearview mirror, and he says, he says, man, what's your name? <laughs> and I told him my name, and he slammed on the brakes and pulled over to the side of the road because he wanted a selfie because crypto is a super weird world. So I'll give you these long-haul truckers. <laughs> they are inspired by a lot of weird stuff. There's no question about it. But the comment was he bought crypto instead of a Vanguard low-fee mutual fund. So, I mean, look, I don't give investment advice. If I did, I would tell you that nobody should have more than 50 basis points of their net worth in crypto. They, they, they shouldn't. There's a lot of evidence that somebody who does have 50 basis points has higher uncorrelated long-term returns than someone who doesn't. But, you know, no one should put their net worth in crypto. But I will tell you that in almost every year since it was invented, Bitcoin has outperformed every other asset class. I mean, if you had put your entire net worth in Bitcoin on January 1st of this year, or had put all of your net worth in a Vanguard low-fee mutual fund this year, 
the difference in a rate of return would be about 130 percentage points because Bitcoin is up about 190 percent this year. Pretty sure that your Vanguard S&P 500 fund doesn't do that this year, last year, the year before, or any year. So these comments, these incumbency bias comments about, uh, well, I mean, I mean it's, it's not as safe as the U.S. dollar. The U.S. dollar is incredibly unsafe over long periods of time and over the last short period of time, unbelievably unsafe, right? I mean, Bitcoin, and I'm just going to focus on Bitcoin as the main crypto asset. Bitcoin is highly volatile, but it goes strongly up over time. The dollar is moderately volatile and it only goes down. There has never been a day when the value of the dollar as an investment asset has gone up because purchasing power declines due to the 2% inflation peg and the fact that we just had 9% inflation last year. So again, yes, it's volatile in an upward direction. The dollar is moderately volatile in a downward direction. So you shouldn't let incumbency bias um, sort of biases. Two last things I'll just comment on. These are all unrelated comments, but I'm just unpacking some of the arguments that were made. This comment about Bitcoin uses as much energy as Norway. I mean, put aside the fact that no, it doesn't. And I mean, I'm the one on this panel who's testified before Congress multiple times on the subject and ran one of the world's largest Bitcoin mining companies, a subsidiary of which Caitlin's on the board of, by the way. So I, I think we know a little bit about Bitcoin mining. But what I will tell you is the entire Bitcoin mining business is about one thing, okay? It is about renewable energy. Yep. That is what the entire business is about. And I'll tell you how that works, okay? Renewable energy is, as an energy source, a terrible source of energy for two reasons. It is because it is intermittent, right? Because the sun only shines during the day and the wind only blows when the wind blows. So it's intermittent and it's unstorable. So when solar energy is being generated, it produces far more energy than can be consumed. Same thing with wind. And it can't be stored for periods when it's not being generated because we lack the battery technology to do that. And that is why we don't have very much solar and wind capacity because it is an uneconomic source of energy. The only way to have wind and solar energy is to either subsidize it, which is kind of the government's current model. Let's force you to buy seven cent a kilowatt hour energy when natural gas will give you two cent a kilowatt hour energy. So you can either force people to take it and subsidize it through tax dollars or you can take the excess capacity that's unstorable and convert it into an immediate economic asset called Bitcoin. The entire business of Bitcoin is wind and solar. So this idea that it's, I, I believe the line was, we're burning a lot of coal and oil. We just aren't. You can't make money Bitcoin mining, burning coal and oil. You can only do it getting essentially free excess capacity from solar and wind farms. I can tell you that because I was the CEO of one of the largest companies in the space. Hydro. And hydro, right? But anything that is zero cost and unstorable, that's what the business is. And finally, there's a bit about socially destructive behavior. I don't know what to say about that. I mean, it is weird when you're in any new area, you know? I mean, I remember being at a wedding in the year 2000 where everybody there was the CEO of barbecue.com and the CFO of pets.com and a bunch of, you know, bankrupt and arguably fraudulent business models that stole a lot of people's investment dollars and went to zero. Was that socially destructive behavior? I, I, I don't know. I ran the banking system for a year, during which I imposed more than a billion dollars of fines on banks for all kinds of discrimination violations and cyber breach dis uh, violations and improper use of personal data violations and credit risk management things. All I know is Jamie Dimon lost more on the London whale trade in one day than most of the scandals that, uh, that Chris just talked about, and nobody thinks the banking system is a fraud. People are flawed. People commit crimes. People commit errors and are negligent. And that's why we have systems to constrain the impact of those things. What all of that means to me is, in a world where 52 million people might disagree with those of you who don't own Bitcoin, but that's a lot of people who disagree with you. They find value in a one and a half trillion dollar market cap thing, even if you don't. And if that market's gonna exist, it would be better to exist inside of a framework that can provide supervision, that can provide capital and liquidity requirements, you know, and clear rules of the road, versus the market we have, because the alternative isn't to not have the market. The alternative is to have an unregulated market characterized by all of the outcomes that Chris describes. So to me, I'd far rather see that inside of a system I can observe. Thank you. Professor Peterson, you want to respond? Well, uh, there's a lot there. Yes. So um, <laughs> uh, let, me, let, me, let me make a uh, go on a couple of points. And you know, also if folks want to ask questions too, Judge, you may have other questions. But first off, I got to say, 
I never said anything about banning cryptocurrency, and I certainly don't advocate banning snowmobiles. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, look, I, I, I'm a market, I'm a free market guy too. I believe that people can buy and sell stuff, but that doesn't mean that I have to like, you know, pretend that I think that it has more value than it does. Uh, and and it also doesn't mean that that I have to. I mean, the, the topic of the panel is whether or not the federal regulators are overextending themselves. And the point, my point in, in, in illustrating seven, not five, uh, major cryptocurrency scandals, of which, you know, I, don't, I thought seven was too many because it was going to go on too long and people would be mad. It's a long list. It's not just seven. It's many, many more. And, of course, there are a lot of scandals in the banking industry. I agree that people, humans are flawed. But... I also think it's pretty clear that this market in particular is problematic. Uh, there are lots and lots of scandals, not you know, disproportionate to the value that they're providing to the economy. Nobody, nobody out there, at least that I've heard, is saying that it should be banned, and that's certainly not what the federal regulators are doing. Nobody at the SEC or the CFTC <laughs> yeah. has been saying that, that crypto should be banned. What they're saying is that, they, uh, is that some of these assets uh, and practices fit within the traditional regulatory framework that you just said that we should engage with. You, uh, so th they should be considered securities or uh, uh, they should be subject, they should be commodities or they should be accounts or the money transmitter licensing rules should apply to them. Uh, uh, it doesn't strike me as, as all that terribly controversial that, for example, you know, um, a suspicious activity reports should be delivered to FinCEN when one particular uh, company is trading large amounts of crypto assets with no know your customer due diligence between the two of them. But we're not arguing against that at all. Okay, well then maybe we're not disagreeing, and that maybe 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 it's just a, a matter of tone because it sounds like there are a lot of things that we agree with. But that is what they're saying in the case that I mentioned in the Nomad cryptocurrency case. Their position is that. The cross-chain bridge does not have to file any suspicious activity reports when people port one type of crypto asset to another, and that even though that looks an awful lot like money laundering, that they're entitled to do that all they want because it's crypto, bro. It's not, it's not uh, you know, dollars. You're not hearing either of us challenging yeah. that. Yeah. Okay, well. Uh, al 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 although I would say that if we're having a dialogue, so here's the exciting part. This is where we become like, uh, remember those old Sunday shows in the 80s where they really got into it? So, so, so one thing I would say, Chris, is when you say that, um, that nobody's arguing to ban crypto, I, I do disagree with you on that. Okay, well, so, I'm so, not arguing no, to ban I, crypto. I, I, I understand, but, but when you talk about the securities regulators and all they're saying is these meet the conditions of securities so they should be treated like securities, one way that the U.S. is very different from other countries is crypto assets that are deemed securities are not allowed to register and trade in the United States. That's how, so, so for example, when the SEC takes the position that the Ripple token, XRP, is a security, they've prohibited FINRA from allowing a broker-dealer to trade XRP. So it's not possible to register. So Apple can list a new share of stock and can register and trade that on the New York Stock Exchange. But if XRP is a security, it is prohibited, right? That's not the case in lots of other countries. I was just with the Brazilian securities regulator yesterday in New York. And their approach is, just like the U.S., some of these are securities, and thus there's a registration process and you can trade them on a securities exchange. But in the U.S., it is in fact true that the SEC does want to ban crypto. Their, yeah. their, their belief is not that it should register and trade, but that it should be banned. Uh, well, I, I don't think that that's entirely clear. I'm not sure I agree with that, and it's certainly not what anybody in Congress has said, and uh, there's I mean, still it's, it's a what, it's what a significant number of people in Congress have said. Uh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, there are some people who have said that. But Including not, the chairman Congress of the Senate Banking Committee. Congress has not passed legislation to ban crypto, and I don't Correct. think that there are leading cryptocurrency proposals that are, that are going to go that far. Um, but uh, I, I do think that that the, the notion that what we're going to do with our banking system is allow banks to leverage themselves up with crypto assets is exposes a lot of taxpayer funds. That's not what is and proposed. That, yeah, that is absolutely the opposite of what's been proposed. Uh, There's uh, no leverage allowed. Uh, well, so, so uh, do you think, let me ask you, do you, and it sounds like maybe we're agreeing about some things then. Do you agree that we should not allow banks to hold crypto assets as reserves? Yes. Great, that's good. I'm glad we got that Okay, but, away. but, but, Chris, do you agree that we should allow banks to custody crypto assets as part of a custody business? 
I, I, Bank of New York is Mellon talking is about. doing it, right? If, right? The Fed yeah, has allowed Bank of New York, New York Mellon right. to do it, but when a startup bank in a red state proposes to do it, the Fed yeah. rug pulls yeah. the state of Wyoming <laughs> after the state of Wyoming right. literally spent I mean, a I mean, hundred meetings with the Fed working on getting this <laughs> charter approved. Which, which That's just hard, not which, what the verb which, means. What's just hard to understand is, when, so when Silicon Valley Bank failed, one of the things that they had on their balance sheet was about $800 million of fine wine, which was custodied for clients, right? And so you think, well, banks are, you know, banks are banks. They shouldn't be having a wine vault, but they do have a wine vault. It's an investment asset, almost a almost billion dollars worth of wine in custody. Why would custodying uh, a bunch of thumb drives with Bitcoin private keys be any different from that? Uh, well, uh, one problem art. is it could be it, they could be the it could be more likely to be the proceeds of illegal ill-gotten gains. Why it could be? Why, they why could, why could be as money well. laundering? Yeah, well, I, I, because, why would you say because, that? Because because there's there's rampant money laundering in cryptocurrency. But like there, it but, but, all the time. but the treasury measure. So there's a treasury financial also, crimes report every year, and in the most recent one at the end of 2022, they talked about this, and they said <laughs> that as a percentage this is of like total a tough market room, activity, by the way. <laughs> Right? As a percentage of market activity, there is far more money laundering, as a percentage, not in absolute terms, but as a percentage, far more money laundering in the banking system than there's a crypto system, which doesn't mean that there's not money laundering in crypto. Well, there well, absolutely well. is. Yeah, and it's illegal, and we, but and we also in the banking go after system. it. Sure, sure. no, right. I know, but you and, and all the other banking regulators go after it, and nobody in the banking system it's, I mean, there's a lot of things that we agree about. We're clearly pissing each other off, but yeah. uh, uh, there's, no, we've there's done a it before. I'm not of pissed off. I find we, it hilarious that we agree about. I mean, uh, you know, w it sounds like we all agree that money laundering is bad. Do we all agree with that? Yes, we do. But we don't all crime. agree that banks should custody crypto. So let's. I mean, let let, let us ask no, you no, a couple I'm questions. For, we just talked about that. I want. I, I, do you agree that there are uh, a lot of people in the crypto industry that maintain that the kinds of things that would facilitate money laundering they claim that they don't have to have money transmitter licenses and can facilitate money laundering. Is that, is that problematic I, to you? I, I, we, we all agree about that. I, I think Caitlin and I Because if we do, maybe you'll no, submit no, no, no. an I, amicus I, brief I, in my I, case. I don't, I don't agree with you. I, I, what I would say on that is, my, my guess is between the two of us, we know the companies and executives who control 90 plus percent of the American crypto market and all of them have money transmitter licenses oh, in every state well, where they're issued. Let's talk about that. So Coinbase, you, you, you know, is held out as a bit of the, you know, one of the better actors, but Coinbase is also one of the primary investors in the Nomad Cross Chain Bridge. So Coinbase has a money transmitter license. But Citibank license, is one of the major investors in the Sinaloa drug cartel. <laughs> I mean, like, so what? The, the market cap of this, well, of this here's, asset here's is one and a half okay. trillion dollars. Yeah, here's, 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 you know, I know, I know we only have about 20 minutes <laughs> left no of this panel, and this is, debate is really exciting. But I also want to give the audience an opportunity yeah. to ask some questions. So <laughs> let's, let, let's intersperse that. So if you have audience questions, uh, please uh, state your name and your affiliation, and please make sure your question is actually a question. Sure. Thank you very much. Uh, Coach Winehouse, uh, Yeshiva University in UCLA. I'm also the founder of Athena Bitcoin where we were primarily responsible for the implementation of Bitcoin as legal tender in El Salvador. Uh, as you know, the only country, country to really do that. I also taught the first crypto course at Booth, University of Chicago, and do uh, oh, doctoral yeah. research in monetary sovereignty and cryptocurrency. And pretty much anywhere else in the world, I feel like a Bitcoin, like sort of a luminary, but then here, like it's really a great honor to, to be with you guys. So thank you. Uh, also, just as a one comment, it's not a question. A little unfair to have two people like that teaming up on Professor yeah. Peterson and also Please misspelling and also misspelling his name, um, just, oh. but but yeah. th because of that because of that I'm going to give him I'm going to give a softball I'm going to give him a softball. Um, so what fundamental challenges, uh, at least to the United States, you know, overall regulatory system, does um, the ability to avoid the SWIFT system internationally for transfers? when a nation like El Salvador could uh, host a bank that can receive or transfer value in dollars, because it's dollarized, uh, or Bitcoin. And obviously, everyone can comment, but it's intended to play into your, <laughs> to your theme there. Um, so I, th I think the most plausible use case scenarios for crypto assets, especially Bitcoin, are in um, uh, you know, countries that have unstable, unstable fiat currencies. Um, and, and and, and also have um, 
you know, government controls on the way that they can move money around. Uh, I mean, it's not, I'm not naive that there, I mean, there is government oppression and tyranny in our world and there's mismanagement of, of economies and crypto assets do provide some benefits to that. And that's one of the reasons that like snowmobiles, I don't want to ban them. Um, but that being said though, I, I, I think that, I think that some of the benefits of those, of those crypto assets are often oversold and that they, one of the, th one of the things that's particularly useful about, about, you know, math puzzle artificial currencies is that they, they can, they, they could do a sales job with them and convince people into doing things that are against their best interests. That's, that's the concern I have domestically. Um, and I'm not sure I got exactly, so if, if you're, if you're, I think I took your point to mean that that uh, in comparison to swift process money transmission, there might be some advantages to crypto assets, but maybe I missed your question. Well, so if you're on the swift system internationally, your dollars, America sees them. Uh -huh. well, Salvador is both because it's Bitcoin, which is right. transfers money not on the swift system, and it's dollarized, so it also has a swift system. I mean, the banks can theoretically hold both of them. As, and they, they are in El Salvador. Yeah, in El Salvador. I guess that makes sense. I didn't know yeah. that, so but I that didn't makes know sense. if you saw any implications for that. I mean, Caitlin might be a little closer. Yeah, yeah maybe, that maybe they do. <laughs> I hadn't thought about it. Cross-border is definitely one of the most important use cases for this technology, cross-border, being able to move money quickly. One of my clients at Morgan Stanley, took it took seven days for them to move their own corporate cash from their manufacturing subsidiary in Thailand to the mothership in California. Seven days to move their own cash. And just being able to move that cash same day, this was 10 years ago now, um, we calculated would have saved them $200 million of capital. Yeah, I, That's I, the use case. I, I don't want to belabor this and not get to the questions, but I'm, I'm just going to, I'll try and sharpen a response to this, which is, A, the, I think the premise of the question uh, is, that somehow Bitcoin transactions on blockchain are invisible, whereas SWIFT transactions are visible by the Treasury Department and by the sanctions regulators, right? That's kind of the premise. People who work in crypto know that that's just not true. Right. Um, blockchains are public ledgers, and there are gigantic companies whose entire business is tracking movements across blockchain from wallet to wallet. So, you know, when people say, and, and you know, this is largely false, but when people say, oh my God, all of this money went to Hamas, I mean, the truth is a very small amount went to Hamas and hasn't gone to Hamas in like nine months because they stopped accepting Bitcoin. But when they did, the reason we know that is because it's transparent and chain analysis can tell us when Hamas got the, got the Bitcoin. But the premise is one that you hear a lot, which is this is all a secret uh, versus Swift is not secret. There's yeah. nothing secret about Bitcoin. Bitcoin is a public ledger that everyone has access to and there are giant companies whose whole business is tracing movement from person A to person B. Can you can you just chime on that? It's, Real quick. it's not it's not secret, but it is opaque. I mean, chain analysis can figure it out, as they did in a bunch of the big scandals, but like like Mt. Gox and other other early uh, things. But it's opaque. Not you know, they can figure it out. Government mm -hmm. regulators sometimes can figure it out, but lots of people can't. No, no, and that's just Bitcoin. It's not and it true. doesn't include tumblers. It's not. It's not true. There there is a effort right now by a gentleman named Nick Carter. To, he's actually paying out bounties for citizen journalists, and he's paid out now 30 different bounties for exposing the truth of how little money went to Hamas. Yeah. It is absolutely I, possible if you have the right technology yeah, skills, yeah, you don't need to be on. a company. Okay, let's go to the next question. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm curious, one or all of the panelists, what's your thought about uh, the proposed digital dollar, either in uh, relation to or in comparison to crypto? So, um, I, I've, I've spoken a lot about this. The, the, what you're referring to is like a, a U.S. central bank digital currency. So almost every central bank in the world is talking about central bank digital currencies. Uh, I have a enormously strong civil libertarian um, opposition to this concept. I, I, the, the concept basically is once there's a CBDC, and there's a lot of assumptions behind this comment, but once there's a CBDC and we no longer intermediate transactions through the, through the banking system. We now have people having direct clearing with the central bank. That makes the central bank capable of deciding which transactions can clear and which transactions can't clear. And you might think, and I, I used to get this a lot when I was the controller, you might think, well, this is America, it's not China, we're not gonna prevent you from buying cigarettes or snowmobiles or whatever. 
I think we all know the fallacy of that comment, right? right? We all know the fallacy of that. I, I sat in my office one time with the CEO of one of the largest banks in the world, and he told me that they were looking at whether they could um, change the way that they did credit card processing to prevent their card from being used to purchase firearms. And I said, I said, would that apply only to credit cards or also debit cards? And he said, uh, both, a anything with our Visa membership. I said, so, so even when it's a debit card, so it's my money, it's not your money, you're not lending me money even on a short-term basis, you won't let me buy a hunting rifle to go hunting with my dad the way that I did when I was 12. Yes, well, it's just too dangerous. That's the thinking that makes CBDCs scary. The, the rationale for CBDCs is what Caitlin says, it's instant settlement versus the, what, the latency that we have in today's system. But for that, we have stable coins with ha which have incredibly high velocity. Instant transactions, privately issued, not controlled by political actors. I don't want the government to tell me that I've burned enough gas this month or I've smoked enough cigarette this month. I'm very worried about that, and I see that as an inevitable outcome. Fully agree. Um, just uh, f full disclosure, Custodia was granted the patent by the US PTO in July of 2022 for a tokenized bank deposit, which is exactly the private version of a US dollar, taking in a dollar deposit and turning around and issuing on an open public blockchain a token for that dollar. Uh, and uh, you might have seen what the Federal Reserve said about that. <laughs> you got any quick response? Uh, I have concerns about, about um, uh, whether or not it's, it's going to be safe and sound, whether or not there are going to be technical details, whether it's going to be hackable. Um, and I'm a lot less worried about, about uh, the government overreaching because the Federalist <laughs> Society will come for them <laughs> and, and will stop them. <laughs> yes. Professor McGinnis. Uh, yes, John McGinnis, no, Northwestern. I'd like to ask about what I see as a paradox of crypto and whether it might be solved, which is uh, the cryptocurrency, while they are decentralized, at least in our current world, really need more centralized holders. Uh, they need uh, uh, wallets or banks or custodians who are regulated, of course, by centralized uh, actors themselves. Is there a possibility in the future that will you see um, blockchain and cryptocurrency create structures uh, that will compete? And so we'll have a more decentralization all the way down even holding these uh, matters and therefore have alternatives to some of the more centralized regulatory and centralized holding structures we have. Or, or as the saying goes, turtles all the way down. Yeah. So um, what I would say is the, the, the promise of blockchain is not that the ecosystem is decentralized. The promise is that the network control is decentralized. In, in other words, the validation of transactions is decentralized. Clearly, um, for any kind of foreseeable future and for retail use, they're gonna be centralized on and off ramps. I mean, you have to buy your Bitcoin somewhere and uh, you have to download a piece of software to have a wallet and some maker is gonna make that. So, uh, you know, for, for me, I, I, I think about it less as is the whole eco, like will there be banks? Yes, there will still be banks. Will there be custodians? There'll still be that. There'll still be technology companies that have CEOs. That will all still exist. The question just is, will you have something different from the automated clearinghouse, which is owned by 16 banks? versus the Bitcoin network, which has how many nodes? 12,000, 14,000? Oh no, it's whatever. more than 40,000 nodes more, now. More than 40, yeah. all right. So, yeah. so tens, of, tens of thousand nodes all yeah. over the world, uh, totally unconnected to each other. None it, of them using any power from coal or uh, <laughs> oil. Yeah, yeah, well, I mean, k kidding aside, not if they're making money. But, but, that, but, that, <laughs> that's, but, that, but that's, that's okay. a different point. Right. I mean, the real point just is, um, you know, will you still have banks, yes. Will you still have custodians yeah. for retail holders? A ab absolutely. The question is about the underlying network. It's the, cr it's, it's, it's the can you have a user-owned network versus a, an investor-owned network like the Clearinghouse or Swift? I think thinking that the other stuff is gonna be centralized, that's a, that's a, it, it's a, it's a false premise that a lot of people have and they attack crypto because Coinbase is a corporation and therefore they think Bitcoin isn't decentralized. I, I think they're two different things is the way I think about it. How, how do you think about it? Yeah, I would agree. Also, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting question about what is the role of a bank? We look at banks because we're so used to dealing in and thinking about money being credit. We look at banks as credit-based institutions, but if you look at the history of banking globally, but what banks originally were were just money warehouses where they stole, stored people's 
gold. It was, they were just custodians and they did business for a fee. The concept that banks have to be a lender in order to be a bank is relatively new in banking history. It used to be that lenders were separated from payment organizations, which were just service providers. So one of the nice things about the Wyoming Charter is it goes back to the roots of banking where your bank is not your counterparty. You're not taking credit exposure to them. Brian made the, made the, um, the, the, the reference earlier about the debit cards, that that was my money. Legally, it's not. I think most of you all know that when you deposit money in a bank, you're making a loan to a leveraged organization. Okay, so if we actually look at banking and say, well, a, a, a bank under U.S. law is legally a depository institution, which is a corporation that is bestowed with the right to take U.S. dollar deposits. That is a very specific definition. And if a state wants to create a depository institution that cannot lend because all it's doing is being a service provider to its customers, not being a counterparty to its customers, that's a, that's a powerful concept. And it, and, it, and it is certainly not without precedent in the banking world. Great. Okay. Let's take two questions at a time and the panelists okay. can address them together. So let's, oh, I think we start with your side. Go ahead. Hey, Keith Roth, Chris from Pittsburgh, PA. Good to see you, Brian. I'm um, curious about the, the custody issue, because as I understand custody banks, if you're holding an asset, it's, it's, it doesn't become an asset of the bank. It's, Correct. They're not supposed to be pledging it. Uh, the wine in Silicon Valley Bank was the customer's wine. It was just being held. What is the argument, uh, if BNY Mellon is allowed to, to hold uh, uh, or to custody uh, Bitcoin or whatever, um, what's the argument that, it, do, they, do the regulars see it, if, if you're holding it, it's some kind of nefarious thing that we don't want you touching, like you can't custody fentanyl or whatever, but you know, what's the argument that you cannot custody something like Bitcoin? There is no legal argument thanks to what Brian ab was able to achieve during his time period at the OCC. It is legal for banks to do this. The issue is that there is an unbelievable amount of incumbency bias in the banking system. It's true in the SEC as well. Everyone's watching the assumption that BlackRock, even though small ETF managers started applying for ETFs for Bitcoin almost a decade ago, but BlackRock is in the driver's seat. There is an unbelievable incumbency bias among federal financial regulators. That's not true of the states, but that's also part of the reason why there is this clash between the states and the federal banking regulators. Can, can, can I just tease out, since we're at a FedSoc event, let, let me just tease out two actual legal issues around this that are kind of kind of fun to think about. So, you know, two things the FedSoc cares a lot about are the non-delegation doctrine and Chevron. Like these are two things we really really care about here. And what's interesting is, Caitlin's right. There's not a legal argument founded in any of these specific provisions of federal banking law about custody and crypto. So what they rely on are these amorphous uh, non-delegation violations, you'd argue, about safety and soundness and reputational risk. So nobody's saying it's illegal, but that what they are saying is we're still not going to let you do it, because even though it's not illegal, it, it could be reputationally risky, and that can mean anything that given regulator wants it to mean. Okay, go ahead. Uh, thanks, Judge Bumate, for, I thought this panel was great. My question, I kind of want to piggyback on uh, the professor's question with so I understand the promise of Bitcoin to sort of take away that money printing ability of the government, right? Uh, but I think that it sounds like we all agree that, you know, building on layer one, uh, not everyone's going to be able to transact in layer one. It has to go to layer two, and then there's going to be these custodia bank, and there's going to be wallets, and there's that centralization. So, uh, and then you're talking about the Bitcoin ETF. Well, it seems to me that the government can come in and regulate on that level. And I guess I'm wondering, how do you see it going forward? Because it's not just the promise of the money printer, but there's also this idea of the peer to peer. And, you know, personally, I would, I mean, I would prefer that there not be any regulation because I'd like the government not to be in, in this space at all. But I understand that that's the way it's going. So how do we maintain the promise why, when it's, it, it is going towards centralization? Okay, let's, and let's get the last question. We can find the answers. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah, so <clears throat> I'm Aaron Ward. My question also relates to a sort of decentralization. Uh, recently, we've seen a trend of the IRS issuing these John Doe subpoenas, where they'll essentially tell a financial institution, all right, give us the data on anyone who's conducted this type of transaction within the last time period. So, like, give us data on anyone who's converted, say, Bitcoin to U.S. dollars from 2016 to 2019 or something like that. And they'll hand these summons to financial institutions, like, say, Coinbase, 
This will often result in getting data from a huge amount of customers. Like I think in the Coinbase case, it was like 10,000 or 15,000 uh, customers they handed data over to. And when applied to traditional financial institutions, the courts have uh, found, you know, there's no Fourth Amendment expectation of privacy, so these don't violate the Fourth Amendment. Uh, do you see any reason that this would be different for cryptocurrency uh, compared to traditional financial institutions? And if not, doesn't that kind of undermine the purported decentralization benefits if the IRS can just come in and individually target these customers whenever they please? Thank you. Who wants to start? On the peer-to-peer -peer point, real quickly, no one's ever shutting Bitcoin down. It's way past that point. And as a result, we can always go peer-to-peer. Most people, just like, just like frankly, if you knew how to make, how to use the command line interface, you could make all of your telephone calls using the command line interface instead of having one of these devices and going through a phone company. Mm -hmm. Most people don't because this provides you with extra security and a good user interface. So we'll never, that, the, the, it, Bitcoin is well past the point where it will ever be able to be banned and that is the fail safe that you can always go peer to peer. Yeah, so, um, so I, I'll try and touch on each of those comments. So on, on the comment over here, the, the interesting wrinkle on what you're talking about, about subpoenas and, and you know, the authority of the government to come and get your records. The interesting authority here is that in truly decentralized situations, there's nobody to serve. And so the weird kind of law that has started to arise in this context is um, th people will like serve Twitter, you know, They'll say, we, we, we can't find the, the, what was that thing called, the Nomad? We can't find the Nomad cross-chain protocol because that's not a company or a person, it's a, it's a protocol. So we're serving the Nomad cross-chain protocol by posting something on Twitter. <laughs> so that, that's the kind of craziness you see there. So it's a little bit different but, from saying you have a, a, an expectation of privacy. And I would argue in, in Bitcoin, you probably have less of an expectation of privacy than you have in a bank account because of the open nature of the ledger. However, you have problems of jurisdiction and service and those things. I mean, to me, that's what I find intriguing about that. On the peer-to-peer -peer bit, what I would just say is, and, and my guess is everybody in crypto has a different theory on this, so like I'll bet Caitlin's is a little bit different from mine, but the way I think about crypto is there are four things going on in crypto. This is all, really all you need to know. There's Bitcoin, which really, honestly, don't quote me on this, isn't really a peer-to-peer -peer transaction network. It's really a store of value. Some people disagree since the title of the paper is different, but there's Bitcoin. There's then a set of what are called smart contract protocols. And you know, there's a certain number of those. Ethereum is the most famous, but there are a bunch of others. Those are the networks that exist to facilitate peer-to-peer -peer transactions in an instant settlement, um, efficiency gaining, financial intermediation kind of way. And so those things are the things that I look to to support that. Then there are stable coins, which mostly sit on top of smart contract protocols. And then there's every other damn thing. So what I think about it is just because Bitcoin is slow or has whatever problems you think Bitcoin has, in no way undermines the foundational relevance of Bitcoin to crypto. But Bitcoin is not where you know, the next Visa network will be built. Somewhere like Ethereum or Solana or Avalanche or Cardano or one of those protocols will be where the next Visa substitute will be built. But again, there are as many different crypto things going on as there are internet companies. That Basically, these are internet stocks at some level. Okay, Professor Pearson, you'll have the last word. You have about a minute. Um, well, all right. Uh, first on the peer-to-peer -peer question, look, I, I get, the, I get the, the, the sort of promise of having people be able to interact with each other without having banks or other big institutions to cause problems for them. But th things like bank, fraud, bank runs, uh, stock fraud, money laundering are real problems and have, been, have plagued market economies like ours for hundreds and hundreds of years. We have a bunch of laws that are supposed to try to prevent and protect people from those kinds of problems. Federal regulators are trying to move forward under uncertainty and radical transformation with no additional guidance from our gridlocked Congress, especially our Senate, to try to figure out the way to deal with these problems. And I, I, I don't think that they're overextending themselves. And I think that we're going to need rules that, that facilitate dealing with those types of problems, you know, whether it's our current set of rules or a new one, if we could find some way to compromise and get something to Congress, I don't know. Um, and then with respect to um, uh, 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 getting data on users of cryptocurrencies from wallet providers, other, other companies, I, I don't, you know, we, we, we usually have know your customer rules in banking and I, just the fact that you're, you have tried to design your system 
to not ha be outside of that doesn't mean that there might not be a legitimate government purpose in getting discovery for a lawsuit or for um, an investigation of criminal activity. There are going to be situations where we need to know who has assets because those assets are the proceeds of, of crime or other inappropriate behavior. And that's a legitimate function of government. Okay, that's all we have time left for this panel. Let's give everyone a round of applause. What a great discussion.